Okay, so well, thank you very much for the introduction. So in this talk, I'll be talking about learning elliptic partial differential equations with randomized linear algebra. And this talk is based on a joint work with Alex Townsend. And uh, I, I just want to start by giving you a, a brief outline of the talk and the main contributions that I will be dis describing. So our aim here is to learn the solution operator of unknown linear partial differential equations of the form L of u equals f from observation data. And what I really mean here is that you have basically a system or an experiment that you can force in some way using a, a forcing term f that you control. And then from this, you can do some measurements and observe the system response u. And ideally from a couple of these training pairs f and u, you would like to learn the solution operators L minus one here that uh, associate this, this system response to the forcing term F. And so the main contributions that I will be describing in this talk is one uh, theoretical result that quantifies how many training pairs F and U you need to learn the solution operator. And secondly, a practical deep learning approach to learn Green's function of linear PDs, and I will uh, go back to this, to define this term later. And so before, so the, these contributions are based on two, on, on three key ideas. So randomized numerical linear algebra, regularity of Green's functions, and rational neural networks. And uh, I, will, I will go through these ideas in the, in, in this talk. And before going, uh, before going, describing this, uh, I just want to uh, step back and give a, like show you three uh, inspiring applications that kind of serve as motivations uh, for us and uh, also illustrate the different aspects of the of the field of PD learning. So the first one here uh, is, a, is a video of, uh, of a biological phenomenon called the uh, spreading depolarization wave happening in the brain. And this is a video from a uh, pig's brain that have been uh, exposed by a surgery. And so from this video, we ideally would like to extract some biolog biological tissue properties. So we'd like to look at this video and extract some information about the underlying biological application. And so this is more type of problem that is typically approached by uh, uh, some researchers in the community that are working on inverse problems. But another interesting point here is that, so for, to capture this, you, you have to, use a, to do a surgery on the brain but ideally we would like to have just access to electrodes information so that we, we don't have to do any alteration of the brain and uh, capture this uh, information from uh, even fewer data that uh, from fewer available data. So it's a very uh, difficult problem. Another inspiring application is a uh, turbulent, this video of turbulent jet flow. Uh, and so basically the, this fluid flow has, uh, at very high speed are usually very difficult and very, it's very computationally intensive to, to simulate them with standard numerical solvers because they need a very high discretization. And so some researchers have been uh, trying to develop what's called a reduced order model that basically don't use the underlying mathematical laws describing the evolution of this fluid, but try instead to, to build a, a, a reduced model that is uh, significantly faster to simulate than standard numerical solvers. And finally, the kind of the last application that I want to highlight is uh, this video here of uh, showing uh, the, the fluid flow of an, an espresso cup. And so for, the, for this application, we can imagine that we only have access to snapshots of temperature measurements that have been uh, acquired by a thermal camera. And instead of here, uh, contrary to the previous applications that I've shown before, we want to infer the fluid velocity and pressure from the temperature measurements. So we have access of one variable of the system and we want to deduce hidden variables where we don't have measurements. And so uh, researchers have recently proposed uh, an approach based on this called physics informed neural networks, which basically take advantage of the mathematical, prior mathematical formulation knowledge that we have and use this noisy and partial measurements of the, of the model to infer other variables or other properties of the system. 
And so uh, I, I now want to, to describe kind of the standard approaches now for PD learning. So due to the recent success of, of deep learning in the past five or 10 years in many applications from image classification to the protein folding problem, uh, some researchers in uh, numerical analysis have now tried to develop neural network type approach to learn models from observation data. And so this approach typically aim to approximate the solution operator that maps the forcing term F that we control to the system response U. And so they do that by approximating the solution operator by a neural network. So the idea is that you take some forcing terms, you, you select some forcing terms F, and then you observe some, you collect some system responses U. And from that, you train a big neural network that will, ask, that will kind of fit uh, this training data. So this neural network will be very expensive to train, to, to train the, the weights of the network. But then the idea is that once we have trained the networks, it's very, it's extremely fast to evaluate. So that's why people are not claiming to have methods that are simulate the Navier-Stokes equation a hundred or a thousand times faster than the numerical techniques that have been developed in the past 40 years. And so three kind of papers that uh, employ these approaches are the uh, Deeponet approach, the Fourier neural operator, and the Deep Green approaches. And all of these uh, kind of papers aim to approximate the solution operator with different neural, ar neural network architecture. So the differentiation here is the, what kind of neural network architecture they use to approximate this operator. So as an example, the Fourier neural operator is based on the fast Fourier transform, while the deep green technique is based on a, a, an object called an autoencoder. And so here, uh, I just want to uh, point out some of the main challenges of the field that motivate us for our, our, the approach that I will be describing in this talk. So, and, the, and I will start this, uh, by, of the, this point on the, on the challenges with uh, the first point, which is the lack of theoretical results. Uh, with this picture where here I show you the, uh, a picture from a, an experiment with our, our method uh, that I will introduce later that shows the behavior of the error of the method with respect to the number of training data. So you see that first we get an exponential decay of zero and then a kind of a stagnation of zero. So from that, we basically want to understand how many training data we need uh, to learn this solution operator and what type of training data are good for learning uh, different for, for tackling different applications. And this brings us into kind of the features, the theoretical results that we want to get, which is the type and number of training data. And this is something that we'll be addressing in this talk. And this, which belongs basic roughly into the kind of the, the whole field of perf getting performance guarantees for numerical for, for techniques, for, for PD learning techniques. And the idea is that if we get this kind of theoretical results and we can use that to design new neural network architectures or try to assess what kind of neural network architectures are good for tackling a specific application. And another very important aspect that we, we won't be addressing in this talk is the question of noise robustness. So we want to understand also how noise affects the techniques into and, uh, and, and assess that with a kind of an uncertainty quantification quantification framework. And finally, the second main challenge here that I want to highlight is the question of interpretability of the model. So in this picture, I show you a, a, a picture from a, a paper that uh, proposed one of the methods I described earlier. And on the, on the top row, it's the expectation of the method. And the bottom is the prediction. And so you see that you have a very good accuracy of the method, so the, the methods that they that are now proposed are very good at predicting different states of the, of the model. But the issue is that we, we emphasize that we not only do we want to have a fast solver or a, a good prediction, we also want to get some physical insight of the system from a, deep, a PD learning method. And so there are lots of features that we would like to get to kind of get a physical interpret, build a physical interpretation of an unknown system. So as an example, we would like to have information on the dominant modes that govern the system's behavior, the dynamics of the system. 
We also like to in, uh, understand the symmetries of the problem, as well as the conservation laws that are satisfied by the solution of your system, or also the singularity of the problem. And so our novel approach here is based on Green's functions. So I will, ref so basically, if you consider a linear differential equation with directly bound conditions, then you know that you can express the solution as the integral of g over the forcing terms f that you impose. And g of x, y here is called the Green's function, and it's, uh, it's a two-dimensional function, a function of two variables. And the idea is that because we have a, this is like a representation of our solution operator, and because we have this representation with a function g, it's much easier to understand and interpret than having a, an operator that maps between infinite dimensional function space. And so as an example here, if you look at the Poisson equation with Dirichlet boundary conditions, and the, I, I illustrate with the Green's function here, you see that on the extremity, the Green's function is zero, which means that you can basically read the boundary conditions of your system on the Green's function. And similarly, we know that the Green's function in that case is symmetric, which tells us something as well on the, on the equation itself. A second example here is the Helmholtz equation with periodic boundary conditions. And similarly, as, as before, we can also read the, the periodicity of the boundary condition on the Green's function at the extremity. And also you see that the number of stripes here that we get are kind of related to the Helmholtz uh, frequency k, so the parameter k in the equation. So you can uh, understand some properties of the equation by looking at the Green's function itself. And so the result that we prove is co concerns elliptic partial differential equations in three dimension of these forms in divergence form, where A of X here is a matrix of functions where the functions are very low regularity. So they are basically just bounded functions. And so in that case, we can express U as a, uh, using the Green's function. And we propose, uh, uh, so our result says that uh, there is a, a randomized algorithm that constructs an approximation to this Green's function with uh, roughly O of one over epsilon to the six uh, number of input output pairs f of u, such that uh, the approximation differs from the Green's function from roughly epsilon. And so this is a randomized algorithm because we'll use basically random function, random forcing terms f as uh, an input data. And because it's a randomized algorithm, these statements hold with high probability. And so the, the proof here relies on two ideas. So the first is randomized numerical linear algebra, and the second is some results on the regularity of the Green's function. And we'll now go to the proof with the first point, which is the randomized numerical linear algebra. So basically, we will use the randomized singular value decomposition to learn the Green's function. And so before I explain what this means for Green's function, I just want to go back to the matrix case. So if we have a, a matrix A here, you can express the singular value decomposition as follows, where the matrix sigma contains the singular values of the matrix A. And we know from the Eckhart-Tung theorem that the best one key approximation of A is given by the truncation of the singular value decomposition. And moreover, the best one key approximation error is given by this tail of the singular values epsilon k here. And so a very important result uh, that kind of introduced the randomized is with the algorithm proved by Halko, Martinson, and Chop uh, around 10, 10 years ago, uh, shows that if you select uh, around k random input vectors, so random input vectors where each entry follows a normal distribution, and you perform this, the matrix vector multiplication, then from that, we can construct an approximation of the matrix A that satisfies this error bound here. So as you see that the bound depends on the best one K approximation error, epsilon K, multiplied by a factor that behaves like square root of K. And also this is a, a probability statement. So we know that this is satisfied with high probability and we can quantify this preci precisely. So as a, an example here, I illustrate the, an application of the randomized SVD where the best approximation error is shown in black. And you see the application of the randomized SVD in blue. And you see that here I used a, a matrix A with exponentially fast decaying singular values. And so because it has fast decaying singular values, epsilon k will be small here, 
which means that we can construct a, 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 a good approximation of the matrix A. And so now we want to generalize this uh, so that we can apply it to the Green function. And so we basically want to make sense of what we mean by a random function, so a random input vector and random input functions. And for round, to, to make sense of that, we basically need the entries of the random input functions to be correlated. So we'll first extend this result to the matrix case where the entries of the vectors are correlated vectors. So normally with the standard randomized SVD, you apply it to standard Gaussian vectors, which are uncorrelated. And we extend this result to correlated Gaussian vectors. So we have a kind of a covariance metric that dictates the distribution of the random inputs that we choose. And so a theorem that we proved uh, extends the result of Halko, Martinson, and Trop in the following sense. So it's basically kind of the similar theorem, except that we now allow for a general covariance matrix, not just the identity. And so it's kind of the same bound here that we get, instead, in, except that we have this gamma k factor. So this gamma k is a factor that we, we can describe explicitly, but this uh, tells us how much prior information of A you have imposed into the covariance matrix. So if we have a good knowledge of A, you can impose that, you can enforce that into the covariance matrix. And the idea is that if you should do it in the right way, then you can hopefully outperform the randomized SVD. So in this example, I show the, the error normalized by the best approximation error. So the baseline is the best approximation error in black. And in blue, it's still the randomized SVD, except that now in red, I've chosen a covariance matrix which has prior knowledge of the matrix A. And you see that by doing so, we can basically outperform the randomized SVD by a factor of roughly 40% in zero. And now we are kind of ready to generalize the randomized SVD to operators. So we want to first introduce the right framework of for operators for describing the Green's function. And so this framework is called the Hilbert-Schmidt operator, which are basically bounded linear operators between binary spaces. And basically Hilbert-Schmidt operators are the generalization of matrices in infinite dimensions. So in finite dimension, a Hilbert-Schmidt operator is a matrix, whereas this HS norm here is just the Frobenius norm of the matrix. But in infinite dimension, a very important example are called integral operators that depend on a, an integral kernel G here. And so you can basically think of it as your solution operator with your green function. So these are Hilbert-Schmidt operators. And so we'll use three important properties of Hilbert-Schmidt operators, namely the one that first, the norm of the Hilbert-Schmidt operators is the equal to the L2 norm of the Green's function. And this is important because the randomized SVD will give us a result on this HS norm, which we can then translate into the L2 norm to state that we have learned the Green's function. We, the green, we, we have learned the Green's function itself. A second result is the singular value decomposition. So Hilbert-Schmidt operators, similarly to matrices, had, admit a singular value decomposition, where this term sigma is as an infinite dimension and contains all the sequence of singular values of your operator. And finally, we also have this Eckhart-Tung theorem, which says that if we truncate the singular value decomposition, then we get the best truncate approximation in this HS norm. So this epsilon k here is the best truncate approximation error and is given by the tail, the infinite tail of the singular values of the operators. And once we have this, we can extend the randomized SVD from the, on the left for matrices to, uh, to, Gauch, um, to Green's functions. So instead of having a matrix vector product with a random input vectors, we have an integral over the Green's function and our random forcing terms, where the forcing term F here is a smooth random function that we sample from a covariance kernel. So here we choose a squared exponential covariance kernel and from the associated Gaussian process, we can sample random functions. And then we can compute these integrals and get the following theorem that states that we can construct an approximation of the scanner G from K plus five random input functions F, such that we have this uh, probability bound, probability statement basically. 
and you, you have this epsilon k factor. And in that case, you get a, in, in front of that, you have a square root of k squared over gamma k. So you still have this gamma k here factor that express how much information of g you have enforced into the covariance kernel uh, from which you have sampled the random function. And so before going back to the Green's function, I just want to illustrate that with a, a numerical example for a two dimension, two dimensional uh, kernel that I want to learn. So I choose this exact kernel here and I apply the randomized SVD with a different choice of the covariance kernels. In that case, I chose a squared exponential kernel with different length scale parameter. And you see that depending on the length scale parameter that I've, cho that I've chosen, I get different approximation error. So if we, if we basically choose the right covariance kernel, then we can get a very good approximation to our exact kernel, which is illustrated by the LAN kernel. And this one differs from the exact one from a factor of 10 to the minus 11. And now we can apply that to the Green's function to learn the Green's function. So we can to quantify how many random input functions we need. So here, this is the Green's function of the Laplace operator, the Poisson equation. And so we have the CM. And you see that from the CM, the factor that we don't know is this epsilon k. So we basically need, if epsilon k is small, then we are basically done because we can just approximate the Green's function with this. So we want to understand how the singular values of the Green's function decay so that we can get a good uh, probability bond here. And the issue that we have is that the Green's function are not smooth near the diagonal. So you can see that on the first derivative, it's not really smooth. And if you go to 3D, it's even harder because in three dimension, Green's function are even singular along the diagonal. And so this uh, property tells us that unfortunately this epsilon k factor here decays very slowly with k. So this, the singular values of the Green's function decay extremely slowly with k. And so to uh, solve this issue, we have to look into another part uh, of the of the theory, which are about regularity of the Green's function. And so the result that we use is that if you look at your domain and you split it into subdomains, then on this cross products x times y, the cross product of the domains, if you look at the cross product of the blue and green domains, these domains are well separated because they don't touch each other. And in that case, we know from Bebendorf and Hagbusch that the Green's function has a low rank structure on this cost product. On the contrary, if you look at the blue and red domains, so in that case, they touch each other. And so on these domains, the Green's function, so these domains are located along the diagonal and the Green's function won't have these properties there. And so now if we choose a one dimensional representation, I can basically split the domains into subdomains. And on each of the green domain here, these are domains that are well separated. So I know that the Green's function will have this low rank property. But along the diagonal on the, on the red strip here, this is the problematic part that I don't know how to deal with. And so first we're going to focus on this low rank property and what this means. So if I just focused on one square or on one good square, a well separated domain, the fact that G is low, has a low rank structure means that G can be approximated by this expansion here. And by approximated, I mean that G differs from this expression from epsilon. And so this is a wrong K approximation to the Green's function G. And so because it's a wrong K approximation, I know that the, and it's smaller than epsilon, the error will be smaller than epsilon. I know that the best wrong K approximation error will also be smaller than epsilon. So I can basically control this epsilon K factor on this subdomain X times Y. And so the idea is that on each of the good domains, we can apply the random mass singular value decomposition. Into, and we, we apply this into a hierarchical structure uh, framework where we start with a good, we start for domain and we progressively split it into smaller and smaller subdomains that are well behaved, where we apply the random mass SVD on each of the green domains here. And so we, we can basically uncover most of the green, uh, all the green, the green function onto most of the domain. And we just need to understand what happens on the, along the diagonal here. And to understand that, we will use the property called the North Diagonal Decay. So if you look back at the Green's function of the Laplace operator here, you see that the Green's function kind of 
as a small, as a kind of a control decay along the diagonal. And we can quantify that precisely using a result from Gutter and Wittmann, which says that Green's function are smooth of the diagonal and they have this certain decay rate here. So G of X, Y is smaller than one over X minus Y. And so this tells us that if we integrate uh, against the diagonal on a small domain so against the diagonal, we can basically control the Green's function on this domain. So the idea is that we use a hierarchical structure where we progressively refine the diagonal here. So we refine the domains until G is very small on the diagonal. So until G is smaller than epsilon along this diagonal. And so we apply the randomized SVD everywhere, except along the diagonal where we can approximate the Green's function by zero. And so in that case, we can control the Green's function in the L2 norm by epsilon on all of the, on the whole complete domain. And so this is a kind of a summary of the proof here, which, so to recall, it states that we construct a randomized algorithm that for a given accuracy epsilon can construct an approximation of the Green's function with roughly one over epsilon six uh, number of input output pairs such that we get this probability statement with high probability. So first you see that this number of input output pairs depend on a gamma epsilon factor here that express how much information, prior information of the Green's function have been forced into the covariance kernel for generating the random functions. And so this theorem is uh, based on these three ideas that I've described, so randomized linear algebra, so the long structure and the of diagonal decay. So you see that this number of input output pairs here, one over epsilon six is quite large. And um, it's also very expensive to use that uh, kind of uh, uh, randomized SVD algorithm in practice. So I, I don't claim here that uh, we'll use this algorithm in practice, but more that this algorithm kind of give us, the theorem kind of give us some insights into how we, how we can uh, uh, design, uh, how many number of input output pairs we need and what type of input pairs, uh, what kind of type of input pairs are good for a specific application. In particular, this tells us that we need a specific covariance kernel and if we can enforce some prior information on the covariance kernel, then we'll get, we should get some better approximation results. And so we are not going to use this kind of theorem in practice for uh, larger applications. So what we'll use instead is a, is a deep learning approach for learning the Green's function from uh, a random from input output data. And this is the approach I will now be describing in the next few slides. And so first I would like to start with uh, showing you kind of a schematic of our method that illustrates the different workflow that we use to learn Green's function. So we start in the part A on the top left of this diagram with the choice of the covariance kernel. So we have seen before that this covariance kernel is kind of critical. And if you don't choose it appropriately, then you can, you can really have devastating results in the end. So in this case, we, we use a squared exponential covariance kernel, but you can imagine to have a different ones that would be better suited for your application. And then from this covariance kernel, we sample in the part B uh, different a variety of forcing terms from the Gaussian process. So a variety of random functions that we'll use to excite our unknown systems. So recall that we have, we suppose that the system that we want to learn is described by a partial differential equation that we don't know. And we want to learn the solution operator through the Green's function. And so once we have excited our system, we observed in the part C of this diagram, so at the bottom left, the corresponding system System responses. So we measure and observe the corresponding system responses. And you can see on this schematic that this, the responses they obey the boundary conditions that you have prescribed on your, on your system. And once we have that, we can basically use both the source and forcing term and the system responses to, in the loss function. So we, we in, in part D, this part D illustrates the loss function that we use to train the neural network. And so we use both the source term that we have uh, we have selected and then the responses that we have observed as training data for the Green's function. And so in the Green's, in the in this loss function, there are two important parts. So one is called the homogeneous solution. 
And this homogeneous solution will give you basically the response of your system onto a zero forcing term. And this basically captures the boundary conditions of your problem. And the second part, the second important part is the Green's function that uh, I've uh, introduced before. So then once we have, so we use that, we train the networks. And once we have these networks, we can then extract them and visualize them. So in, in part F, you see the homogeneous solution as the output of the homogeneous solution in your network. And you see that this uh, function satisfy your, the boundary condition. So at u equals zero, it's, it satisfies u equals zero equals minus one and u of one equals one. So it satisfies your boundary conditions. And on the right, uh, you see the, you recover the Green's function of the Laplace operator in this case. And so this is basically the deep learning method for learning Green's function. And so first, once you have that, you basically have a fast solver or a fast solver, because if you want to compute a new solution to uh, a, a new forcing term, you can just uh, compute this integral and then uh, you, you get a fast solver for that. But if I recall to you the kind of the second main challenge that I've introduced at the beginning of this talk, which was the interpretability of the model, we want to basically we claim that from the Green's function, we can uncover some physical properties of the model here that we can't do with standard deep learning techniques. And so here to illustrate that, I basically take a Green's function of a non known PDE and the associated homogeneous solution neural network. And once we have tried them, we can then analyze them. So what can we do? Basically, we can extract some features. So if you look at the Green's function, you can see that it's symmetric for X and Y. So it has an X, Y symmetry. And this basically tells us that the associated operator, so the partial differential operator, is self-agent. And basically, any kind of symmetry that you can look, find, that you can discover from your Green's function can be translated equivalently on the partial differential equation. Similarly, you can compute the eigenvalue decomposition of the Green's function. And you can basically identify the dominant eigenvalues and eigenmodes of your operator. Because we know that there is a kind of a one-to-one -one correspondence between the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the Green's function and the one of the partial differential operators. So once we have computed the Green's function, we can understand the modes that dominate the dynamics of the system. And the second features that we want to learn is based on our choice of neural network architecture. So the feature is called the singularity location. And this is because we, we basically use rational neural networks to learn Green's function and homogeneous solution. And rational neural networks are a type of networks that we have introduced about a year ago uh, that are basically neural network with rational activation functions. And we proved uh, in, a, in a paper that this, uh, networks have high approximation power, which means that they can approximate smooth function more efficiently than the standard value networks uh, with fewer number of uh, network parameter. But the idea here is that not only do they have this high approximation power, which is ideal for learning Green's function, but they also support feature extraction to learn the singularity of the system in a way that we'll see in the next slide with the, next, with the example that I will show you. So in this example, I consider the advection diffusion equation. So you see that there's a part here with the second order derivative is a diffusive part of the equation. And here's the advection part. I turn it on only on the right half of the domain. And you'll see why in a, in a, in a couple of seconds. So once we have this equation, we can then generate some forcing terms and solve this equation to uh, get some training data and then train on Green's function and homogeneous solution. And so we basically do that and then we visualize the Green's function. So first, if we focus on the Green's function, you can look that at the bottom half of the domain, you recognize a pattern that is typical to the kind of the Laplace and Green's function, which basically tells us that the operator, that the equation here would be diffusive on the left half of the domain, which, is, uh, which corresponds to the reality. On the contrary, if you look at the top right of the Green's function, we recognize a, a pattern that is very typical to the advection uh, to advection dominated equation. So it's basically telling us that I've turned on the advection here on this part of the domain. And now if we move on to the homogeneous solution, so first you see a very 
good agreement between the exact one that I've computed with a numerical solver and the one that I've learned with a neural network. You see that this numerical solution, this homogeneous solution is kind of bended near the singularity. So it changes behavior along the singularity at x equals zero that I've imposed. And the idea is that now this homogeneous solution is represented by a rational neural network, which have uh, which has poles, which means that there are points in the complex planes where this rational neural network is unbounded. And if we plot, if we evaluate this neural network on a complex plane and we plot its face portrait here, we can look that the poles of the rational neural network tend to cluster near the singularity of the equation. So they tend to cluster near x equals zero. And by looking at these poles and the location of the poles and the, how far the cluster, we can identify the location uh, and the type of the singularity of the underlying uh, equation. So this is illustrating the kind of features that we can capture uh, from the, the rational neural network representation of the homogeneous solution. And I want to end here with a, a last example uh, on the on Stokes flow in two dimension in a lead driven cavity. So first I illustrate on the left uh, the whole homogeneous solution of your of the system. So this is showing you the magnitude of the velocity uh, against a zero applied with respect to zero applied body force. And the streamlines here in a, so, so the white lines here shows you the, the streamlines. So the, basically the, the, the fluid flow, direction of the, of the fluid flow. And you see first a very good agreement between the exact velocity homogeneous solution and the one that I've learned with a neural network. So you see a very good argument, even if I used a very quite coarse discretization for the number of measurements that I've acquired from my system. And then in the second part, I will show you the Green's function. So in this case, it's not exactly a Green's function. It's a matrix of Green's function because we have two components of the forcing term of the force. So the X and Y components that I vary. And so I, I enforce this, this forcing term. I, and in response, I observe two components of the velocity. So I observe the X and Y component of the velocity solution. And this is why we get a matrix, a two by two matrix of Green's function, which illustrates the, basically the system responses. So the two different component response against in, action, in reaction to this forcing term that I've prescribed. So first, if you look at the each individual function, you can get some information about the symmetries of your problem by looking at the symmetries of these functions. But moreover, in this case, when you have a vector valued PDE, you can also look at the different relations between the this component of this Green's matrix, and you can look understand this kind of the couplings between the different components. So for instance, this uh, G1 block here shows you the contribution of the Y component of the forcing term to the X component of the velocity. So you can basically understand how these, uh, which component of the forcing term act on which component of the velocity that you observe. And I'm now going to, to conclude this presentation by summarizing the main points that we have seen. So first we have, I've described uh, a theory for learning Green's function. So Green's function of uniformly elliptic operators in, in this specific form. And this series is based on a couple of, res, uh, of results in the literature. So first, the randomized SVD, uh, the hierarchical structure, low rank, hierarchical low rank structure of the Green's function, and the decay of the diagonal of the Green's function. And uh, so this result, as I said, is, is based on the generalization of the randomized singular value decomposition. So we have generalized the randomized SVD algorithm to, uh, in, to matrices with correlated inputs. And we are hoping that this could also have application in, in big data where just on the matrix numerical linear algebra case where one wants to learn matrices from matrix vector products. And in the, in the case where you have already prior knowledge on the matrix, we hope that we, we could enforce that into the covariance uh, matrix for learning uh, these matrices. And so that we can basically outperform the standard randomized SVD. So basically get an approximation with fewer number of, in, of uh, matrix vector products. And finally, the last one that I want to highlight is that is our, our deep learning approach that aim as getting some uh, interpretability of the models through the Green's function. 
And so we have a, a Python package that has been implemented in TensorFlow for learning this green function that is fully available online. And so this uh, basically concludes the, my presentation and I thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Um, so let me start off with a question. You didn't say very much about the architecture of the deep learning network. So I'd be quite yeah. interested to hear how, how big are these? How many parameters are you training? Yeah, so we, we use a quite simple architecture actually. So we, we just use a fully connected neural network with uh, five number of uh, layers and a, a width of 50 neurons basically. So we haven't yet explored, uh, ideally one would like to design a more complicated architecture, for instance, based on the hierarchical structure of the Green's function. And we, we don't know yet how we could enforce that uh, into the neural network, but uh, that's kind of the hope that we'd like to achieve later. Sure. So did, did you say 50 neurons? Yeah, 50 neurons on each, uh, on on each, each layer. layer. Yeah. yeah, so even so, just looking at it from a numeric analysis perspective, you're giving yourself lots and lots of parameters there. Yeah. Um, you're essentially deciding on a basis with which represent the Green's function. Um, yeah. And that basis has um, that dimension. And then you yeah. find those coefficients. Is, is there any reason intuitively why that's a good basis in which to represent the Green's function, do you think? Uh, so kind of the basis that we have is is, is driven by the, the rational function. In fact, yeah. these are the important part. And the idea is that if you sometimes the, the Green's function will be singular on the diagonal. So yeah. having a rational function that are able to have poles as well is, we, we believe it's quite important because we we kind of auto of uh, allow the Green's function, the neural network to have singularities as well with our representation, with our choice of rational functions. Yeah, of course. And then I think I'm allowed one more question because I'm in charge. Um, in terms of sensitivity, does this map that you're learning, are you, are you interested in how sensitive, what the condition number is? that kind of question? Uh, so I think this is basically given by the Green's function. So the idea is that because we have this Green's function here, if we have some perturbation on the forcing term here, we can basically translate that using the Green's function. So this, we will have some error like u minus u tilde is smaller than the L2 norm of the Green's function times the f minus f tilde. So I guess this is, will be given by the the Green's function itself. But you have an approximation to the Green's function, so... Yeah. Yeah, yeah we, we haven't looked yet at uh, uh, how noise will affect this approach, basically. But yeah. we, we are kind of hoping that with this inverse formulation, because we have a function here, it will be kind of easier to, or more stable than approaches that aim to learn a coefficient of the PDs itself. Sure, yeah. Okay, great. There's more interest online. So let's pass over to Carola, first of all. Yes, so thank you so much, uh, Nicholas, for a really uh, fascinating talk. Thank you very much. So you also mentioned as one motivation for doing this uh, if, and to have an efficient numerical solver. Yeah. So how, how does your deep learning based solver actually compare with other numerical, you know, kind of standard numerical approaches for anisotropic Poisson? Um, um, so I, I don't know exactly, but I'm guessing it, it's like, it would be, once you have, it's, it's very, basically, it would be slower to, to uh, like train the networks. But when, once you have trained the networks, you just have to, to use a quadrature rule to evaluate, uh, to evaluate it at a, at a new, uh, at a new forcing term. So I guess it would be, it's, like same as uh, similarly to like this new deep learning approaches will be extremely f way faster to to evaluate at new forcing terms because we, we just have to compute just a numerical integration basically yeah you don't need to solve a linear system basically. exactly yeah yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i mean you know one one uh one potential really uh, cool way to go, although I, I have no idea how you how you would do this somehow, is of course to think about maybe similar ideas in the context of nonlinear PDEs. I mean, that's you know your your approach, of course, is super targeted for the linear case. Yeah, so I'm really glad you mentioned that because I have this kind of extra slide that shows. Ah, kind you of have the, future challenges, actually. <laughs> the future challenges that we have, and one of course is the nonlinear PDEs of course. So 
one approach for that could be to uh, tackle time dependent applications where you can basically do a linearization with a, a good time stepping scheme. So learn in that case, the, the forward operator that will bring you from one time step to another, or use this approach uh, that has been kind of uh, proposed by uh, the group in uh, Nathan Scoot's group, which are based on auto encoder and basically map your operator so that you have a, a linear representation. Uh, in that case, it's quite challenging. We expect it will be quite challenging that once you do a mapping here, so use a more complicated neural network to 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 understand to get your to, to capture your nonlinearity, uh, the interpretability question becomes much more challenging once you once you have done all this mapping here. So, yeah. so these are two different kind of approaches that we might consider for nonlinear PDs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Corolla. Um, and Aria has a question or two. Yes, uh, thank you. So my first question is as follows. I have a sense of unease with all the many papers lately on using neural networks to solve PDs. And the sense of unease is, and there's already somehow alluded to it, but I'll be more explicit, with the issue of stability. So we know that there are generative adversarial networks and neural networks can be very, very unstable. So the function between the input of the training set and the outcome can be unstable. And somehow this is never done explicitly in solving PDEs. So what is the stability of the scheme? Uh, okay, and then I have another question completely opposite direction, so let's start with that. Um, so it's again kind of this... Um, I we, we haven't really studied kind of the stability of the neural network scheme here. So it's kind of a difficult question to answer in this case. So the kind of the theoretical result uh, it is basically based on the randomized SVD, so we expect here that everything will be will be fine on this on this uh, on this set. But on the neural network itself, uh, yeah, it's it's uh, I, I don't know I don't have the answer yet. It's it's kind of difficult question to answer. Okay, so my another question is: here is a suggestion, or I wonder if you consider it for your future challenges to apply something similar to the Riemann Hilbert problem. Okay. into the universal transform of focus, because this can hugely extend the range of elliptic PDs to which we can apply it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm noting that. Yeah. I would be very happy to, to look into that later. Thank okay, you. thank you, Aria. Um, there's a question in the Q&A, Nicholas, maybe you can read that yourself, can you? But I'll read it out. Uh, I you. can't really because I'm like full screen now. Okay, no problem. I can read it out for you. Okay. Yeah. It's from uh, Aria's, one of Aria's co-editor-in-chiefs of the IMA journal, Andre Suli. Um, so he points out that if you go to greater than four dimensions for the, your PDE, then you're no longer looking at Green's functions in L2. So he's assuming that you can't go beyond a certain dimension. Yeah. It it's uh, an excellent point he did, and that's exactly why we are restricting to the Green's function uh, to dimension three. So if we go higher, then the Green's function is not in L2, it's in L1. So it becomes much, much harder to to tackle this problem. And we kind of are now looking as well to extending the theory to parabolic equations, for instance. And we have ex ex exactly the same issue where and if you consider a parabolic equation in dimension two, the Green's function is not in L2 as well. So there are a lot of challenges. If you if you want to go to higher dimension, you will have to use a completely different new, completely different approaches where you need the really to learn it in the L1 norm instead of the L2 norm. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thanks you for clarifying that. Um, so that's great. We're still sticking to time, which is good. And thanks for all the excellent talks so far.